Homeschool families, we often talk about them at Lorehaven. That's because so many homeschool families love Christian-made fantastical stories, but of course, this was not always so. Like some Christians before and some now, some homeschool families have not been so happy about fantasy and science fiction, and others have been downright hostile about these stories. What changed? Why are these families now flocking to Christian fantastical authors at homeschool events? One homeschool graduate, whose family helps organize one of the biggest homeschool conferences in the nation, joins us to explore these questions today on Fantastical Truth. Welcome back to Fantastical Truth, the podcast from lorehaven.com in which we explore fantastical stories for God's glory and apply their meanings to the real world Christ calls us to serve. I'm E. Stephen Burnett, Lorehaven's publisher. I also co-authored The Pop Culture Parent. And I'm Zachary Russell, and I could not tell you which Harry Potter house I belong to because I still haven't read Harry Potter. It's not because I'm anti-fantasy. I just haven't gotten around to it. I mentioned that because we're going to be talking about the big H today, because this is episode 116. Why do homeschool students love fantastical fiction? Spoiler alert, I missed out on this conversation, which is too bad because I find the Harry Potter topic always fascinating. It's a great conversation starter about Christian responses to fantasy. And now, gentle listener, I get to hear this conversation along with you because it's between Zach and our guest today. I had to sit this one out because... I guess I shouldn't have talked about Harry Potter because then all of my technical equipment for that specific interview became cursed. <laughs> I think I have enough faith now to roll back the curse. Uh, just speaking a little bit facetiously here, I have improved my podcast workstation for this episode and onward. Yes, we missed you, uh, Stephen, for this interview, but I, I think you'll enjoy it. And I think uh, you, our listener, will enjoy uh, hearing from our guest today. Uh, because we talk about Harry Potter, we talk about all kinds of fantasy and sci-fi and how parents of the past kind of discern these stories or maybe didn't so much like them and how that's changed and in, in how parents are addressing these stories today. And I got to say, it, it, it's encouraging, Stephen. I, I think these books as categories, there's a very different attitude towards them. I, I think just in general, I mean, spoiler alert, I think in general, Christians are less suspicious and less wary of these stories as a genre. Now we, of course, there's always a need for discernment, but these books are just being associated with better experiences, I guess you could say, and a closer, they're not anti-biblical, I think, like a lot of people worried about. Zach, that's the response that I see to fantasy, at least among the homeschoolers that go to the Realm Makers bookstore uh, whenever we are at uh, homeschool conferences across the nation. I've joined them for, is it two or three events? No, nope, two events uh, this year, uh, 2022, as well as several others in the past. And at least the families that go to the conferences really enjoy these resources. We are always careful to say, hey, these are all Christian authored fantasy and science fiction books and others. Uh, there's even some study Bibles there, books from other Christian publishers, as well as my own book of the pop culture parent, which has a dragon on the cover. Uh, so it counts. It belongs at a, a bookstore with a Christian made fantasy and sci fi, and at least that respect. Ethan, our guest, is actually a part of the family that puts together the Florida Parent Educators Association. Uh, that's the conference I just got back from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they always host it in Orlando, at least uh, at this time. And it was a big event, uh, just as it was when I was there uh, last year, 2021. It was huge this year, and lots of people stopped by the booth. They are wanting these stories for themselves for their kids for their families and they still are very discerning like people are want to know hey you know my teenager and like i don't think she ought to be reading uh, stories with a lot of romance in them because like i i happen to know that this may be an area of vulnerability for her uh, others of course want to ask about hey is there any language is there any violence and most of the books we get to tell people not yeah there's it's a perfectly safe book it's uh completely clean nothing to worry about <laughs> no the, the more accurate thing is to say well everyone is different and every story is different and some of these stories will have challenging material like a battle between good versus evil you're going to have violence in there you're going to have things to discern you're going to have flawed characters things like that it's not like the harry potter series uh, where you have some biblical themes in there uh, reflected almost incidentally by an author who probably is not a christian these are Christian authors, and so largely you're going to get Christian worldview in these stories. But Christian worldview leads to some challenges. And when we explain it that way to parents, almost everyone gets it. It's just a matter of trying to find the best kind of story that their child will enjoy or their teenager will enjoy and the kind of story that's not going to tempt them to sin any more than usual. 
Yeah, I think for a lot of the content in stories, you know, we we have to have sort of a discernment 2.0 mindset. It's not, you know, what content is there, but what is the attitude of the story towards that content? Because, you know, we, we see a lot of content in the Bible. We see violence. We see illicit sex. You know, we we see witchcraft even. But it's how the Bible presents those things that matters and that is the, the entire point of why we see those stories. I've had this attitude a lot towards movies, Stephen, where there's there are movies with a lot of shooting and violence. It doesn't really trouble me because it's it's about good guys fighting bad guys, for example, or you know criminals getting caught by the authorities or or something righteous otherwise. But it's when the violence is flippant. Uh, or when violence is glorified and you're just, you become kind of numb to people dying or worse when, when violence is sort of used as a self soothing kind of tool, like a, uh, like a serial killer or a, a, re- a revenge story. I, I really just, I can't watch revenge stories really for me. That's not good for my soul. I think it's that same attitude with a lot of other things. Now, <laughs> this is probably too many topics to go into. You know, Naomi is the same way with romance in stories. She she doesn't like the movies or the books for our kids that that really present, you know, sensory overload kind of way, like a very immersive way about what what it is like to f- uh, fall in love with someone cuz hey, our kids are not ready for that yet. They're they're in school. They they don't need to, you know, no boys is is kind of my general attitude anyway, but that's not the stage they're at. They're not at the falling in love stage and getting married stage. So, you know, they don't really need that right now. Uh, now with my, with my youngest child, my son, he showed me this morning, a, a Lego figure and, uh, the Lego guy had something on his belt. And, uh, my son said, Oh, oh, that's his gun. <laughs> I'm like, it's just like a blob or something on the, on the paint. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a boy. He's just, he's very much a boy. He thinks about fighting and he thinks, but, but you know, he thinks about it in a very chivalrous way. It's like, okay, this is like the soldier protecting the princess or whatever, you know, it, it's not like, oh, this is the guy that's going to go beat up everyone. Um, so I, I think context matters. I think purpose matters. And, you know, really it's the meaning of the story that matters. And that's a lot of what Ethan and I will talk about on this, uh, episode. Well, I, I look forward to hearing that. I'm glad I got back in the studio with my upgraded equipment in time to at least shill most earnestly for not just the Realm Makers bookstore at homeschool conferences, but the original Realm Makers Writers Conference, and that's our first sponsor for this episode, the Realm Makers Conference for 2022. It's scheduled for July 21st through 23rd in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And this is directed towards those who are not only fans of these stories, but want to help create them, maybe even professionally. If you're excited to take this next step on your journey, and you don't need an actual trip to space or time or forging your own sword, Instead, join us for the Realm Makers Conference in 2022. This annual event will again be in person, this time in Atlantic City, and it's also live online. So even if you can't travel to Atlantic City in July, you can still see the teaching in real time because every class will be live streamed for virtual guests. Whether you attend live or online, everyone who attends has a chance to connect on the Realm Sphere, a dedicated conference space in the online community. Realm Makers 2022 is an amazing value because this year as well, everyone who attends gets access to replays of every class available through the Realm Sphere. Whether you're attending real or online, if you have a manuscript, a story you've made that you want to pitch to agents and editors participating at the conference, you can do that by registering for Realm Makers 2022. Find the link in our show notes for this episode 116 or go to lorehaven.com slash podcast sponsors and look for the sponsor right there at the top. So Stephen, tell me more about the FBA conference, your experience there. I, I get to hear, we'll get to hear about Ethan's, but you know, tell me what it was like for you. What was it like to be there kind of co-located with Realm Makers, with other Christian fantasy authors, but what were some of the, the moments and conversations that really stand out to you? Absolutely. Well, we had eight authors total, including myself, um, trying to remember all their names. We got the news posts still at Lorehaven, which we can also link to in the show notes. Uh, it's a big booth, uh, actually hosted right there uh, beside the FPEA headquarters booth. Uh, Really fancy there at the Rosen Shingle Creek Resort. I believe the signage I see there says uh, that it is uh, located at or near the source of the Everglades. So pretty significant region there of Florida-wise, as far as I can tell. So I got to be Florida man there for 
at least three days. And I will tell you, Zach, I will tell you, we actually did see Florida man at one point. Uh, he was in line uh, with his family to talk with Mike, Larry, the cucumber, now Rocky, who is also the author of the Dead Sea Squirrels series. And I turned to a friend and I, I just I, I don't mind in the most respectful way possible. I just point and I whisper, it's him. It's, it's Florida man. And it's true. It was just whatever you're imagining. That was the guy right there. Uh, and it turns out that Florida man is based and wholesome and uh, he's a great dad and he loves his family and he buys them great uh, Christian books like the Dead Sea Squirrel series. So. Everything turned out better than expected. Florida man lives and he is a Christian homeschool dad. Uh, so do many of the authors who were there. It was just great to hang out with them. Uh, just lovely, lovely folks. Every single one of them getting to share these kinds of stories. I sold plenty of copies of the pop culture parent as always, uh, which is always kind of fun because most folks there understandably are there to find fantasy or science fiction for their kids. But occasionally you get somebody who wants a book that is about discerning these kinds of stories for their kids and for the glory of God. And then the other authors know to point them in my direction. And then if I know that someone is looking for a middle grade or YA book about mermaids, well, there's Catherine Jones Payne right over there uh, with her books and her posters. Uh, folks are loving those. Uh, we had Tim Shoemaker, who has a family devotional books as well as adventure novels geared towards male readers. Uh, right beside him was uh, James R. Hannibal, frequent guest on uh, Fantastical Truth. Uh, he had his whole Light Raider set up there, as well as his books. Uh, not only Wolf Soldier uh, for uh, younger readers, but his uh, military suspense books as well. And one thing, Zach, I did notice at this event is that I think, well, it may just be my imagination. It is a booth all about imagination after all. But I did notice that a lot of parents were, of course, obviously first shopping there for their kids. That's why you come to a homeschool conference. This is your mission. But I did notice that a lot of people were also willing to get stuff for themselves. Uh, some people were looking for, we well, don't want to say adult fiction, because unfortunately that term has been uh, stolen from us. But I, I would say fiction. books for grownups, yes. And make sure you hyphenate grownups, you know, like C.S. Lewis did, because we like C.S. Lewis. But folks are ready to go beyond just C.S. Lewis. They want to read like maybe some of James R. Hannibal's books that are for grownup readers, you know. Obviously, it's, it's James. It's not going to be adult fiction. You know, uh, James is also very based and wholesome. So he uh, writes great, uh, great books that are just not necessarily for younger readers. You know, younger readers, uh, teenagers can read them, uh, but there's going to be books for grownups. So I'm noticing now that maybe there is some slow movement towards grownups uh, realizing that they can read fiction for themselves, that you don't have to stop it to C.S. Lewis. Or maybe the Frank Peretti books you enjoyed, uh, you know, back in the '80s or '90s. Like you, you can get books for yourself. It's great. You know, these are not only wonderful tools for enjoyment, but they are discipleship tools uh, in the hands of a good author. So that's happening. Uh, and then I also distinctly remember there was a guy looking because Realmakers Bookstore now has a lot more audiobooks, uh, and there was a guy looking for uh, audiobooks, and I pointed him towards the the Frank Peretti Cooper Kids Adventure audiobooks, all eight of them, and he bought. All eight of them. Oh, there's eight. I thought there was no. Only there four. are eight Cooper Kids Adventure series. There was a ah, phase one and a phase eight. two. Yes, and um, okay. I mean, I got to be basically the fanboy there and recite all the titles in order and know that they changed the title of the eighth book for some reason. Uh, there was a woman who was coming through on the very last day, uh, Saturday. Uh, they just announced over the audio uh, that the vendor hall was about to close, so everybody better skedaddle. Uh, and this woman came through the booth saying, okay, I'm looking for something for my, what was it? I think she said her 10 year old boy who likes action and adventure. Mm. And I could think of many titles there. Uh, but again, I couldn't help but thinking of, you know, Peretti's uh, Cooper kids adventures. And so I took her over there and I gave her the quick pitch and she bought one or two and skedaddled woman on a mission there. Everyone is. And so are we, uh, it is wonderful to be able to connect with the audience for these stories. We know they're out there. Uh, it's not a niche genre. It's simply a genre that is finally connecting with the very readers who all along are being prepared to enjoy Christian made fantastical stories. Did you experience anyone that sort of turned their nose or, uh, you know, had sort of a skeptical take about, you know, why do we need books with dragons or spaceships or, or magic or anything like that? Not in Florida. Yeah. Florida is the free state, right? You know, so it's all about freedom. <laughs> well, hopefully freedom with responsibility, you know, as uh, Paul cautioned the Galatians, it's for freedom that Christ died. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge in the flesh. I, that seems to be the verse at the back of people's minds. I have heard some skepticism at other events, and I've heard some of the other authors talking about this. 
Uh, I was in Nashville, I think last year, and I think there was one guy who wanted to find a fantasy novel without magic. This was going to be a very mm. stern requirement of his. Just like a medieval kind of Exactly. Yes. Well, Mm -hmm. you can do that. And there's some authors who lean in that way. You know, they they do fantasy. Other worlds are okay, but, you know, natural law magic in the other world is not okay. Mm -hmm. I want to respect that, although I I don't think it's a conviction. I think it's more of a preference. But if someone has, you know, obviously legit occult temptations in their past, then yes, that is a legit conviction. You don't want something that's going to make you sin any more than usual. It actually is a stumbling block. Uh, like the kind that Paul uh, warned about uh, in his epistles. So I can respect that. Uh, but at the same time, we do have books for that. Um, we have some fantasy novels. Like actually, uh, Emily Hayes' Seventh Son, I would say, counts as a fantasy that technically doesn't have magic. But as we were talking about behind the scenes at the booth, it's still a magical story simply because it feels magical. You're in this uh, Arctic wasteland, and it's uh, you know another... Another world, it's not like Alaska, but it feels like Alaska, only more magical. And there's there's some creatures uh, along the margins and, you know, swimming under the ice. And there's the Aurora Borealis. And it's still a magical story. You're going to get that aesthetic in there, even if, you know, nobody's waving a wand around. Uh, there's all kinds of stories for all kinds of preferences. But I, I don't, I just I decreasingly see, you know, maybe it's self-selection bias, though, Zach. You know, I'm guessing it's right. someone super skeptical of the genre isn't necessarily going to come into the bookstore. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that as I'm, I think Ethan shares uh, more homeschool families now are moving past some of the, uh, some of the discernment 1.0, uh, which is yeah. often sub biblical discernment and based more on appearances than on wisdom uh, and moving into a more biblically wise and rational approach uh, toward discerning fantastical stories. Yeah, well, if, if you, our listener, are new to this podcast, maybe you came here because of uh, the interview with Ethan Nunn or because of uh, you know the FPEA conference, uh, we really invite you to go back and check out our episodes 50, 51, and 52. If, if you're a little bit skeptical yourself, that's fine. Uh, go check out our episodes uh, in the Fiction's Chief End series. These are called uh, Do Christians Really Need Fiction? Do Christians Really Need Fantasy? Do Christians Really Need Sci-Fi? And we go over some big ideas there that fiction is God's idea. Fantasy trains us to imagine God and his true story. And sci-fi is a shared universe inhabited by common grace. And so there's a lot more that we talk about in those episodes, but I think that's a good primer uh, for a lot of what we talk about in this podcast. So we won't, you know, re- rehash all the uh, ground we've covered, but uh, we're just going to go in now and uh, hear from Ethan and kind of his perspective from the the homeschool family that's leading this homeschool conference. Speaking of fantastical creatures, I think I hear the sound of a beating griffin's wings. So let's see how Ethan chose to arrive at our studio. As founder and chief creative officer at Project 6-8, Ethan's heartbeat is for equipping youth to use their passions along with the positions of leadership God has placed them in to influence the world for Christ. Ethan has been active in the arts from music to theater for most of his life, covering a range of characters and instruments. Along with this, he has a deep love of learning and teaching that has led him to be a middle school teacher at his church. His love for public speaking has given him the honor of preaching at churches, be a guest on podcasts, and speaking at the FPEA homeschool convention. And his passion for the written word has given him the chance to write for blogs, magazines, and he is in the process of writing his first book. Ethan wants to see the next generation of Christian leaders arise and refuse to do nothing. Uh, that's a really interesting phrase there. I like that. So Ethan, welcome so much. Uh, w- welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you on. And uh, sorry, Stephen couldn't join us today, but it's it's good to meet you. So Yeah, welcome. it was great to meet you. Thanks, Zach. And, and I'm, I'm sure Stephen's here in spirit at, at the least. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's right. Actually, before we get to the questions, so tell me, uh, since I wasn't there at the FPA conference, uh, yeah. tell, me, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about your meeting with Stephen and kind of what uh, topics you guys talked about there for sure for sure so um yeah it was it was a great convention it was um one of the i think the largest ones attended there and i know that there was like a lot of um great sales and a lot of people there specifically for um the fiction authors and the fiction writers and everything and so one night Stephen actually had a chance to discuss after you know vendor hall closed and we were um discussing just a lot of stuff since we'd last seen each other but we were discussing specifically um, the future, I think, of where fantasy and sci-fi were going in the homeschool community. 
and where in a, a broader general sense where story was going because it seems um, in a lot of er- areas that we're coming to an end of an era in storytelling. The, Mar- the Marvel franchise has kind of started to slowly simmer a bit, but um, we kind of talked about that, talked about the DC universe, uh, the different storytelling techniques there, as well as what they're, what Star Wars is doing, what Lord of the Rings is doing. So we covered very broad range of topics, as well as what Christian storytelling has gotten right and what Christian storytelling has gotten wrong. So it was a really interesting conversation that we were able to have and a lot of interesting viewpoints that were given in that. Well, and I'll have to insert here Stephen's favorite hashtag, uh, release the Snyder verse. Uh, yeah, so they, exactly. they got they got the Snyder cut out, and now apparently there's a whole universe of stories that he wants Zack Snyder to tell. So I'm not too big of either a Marvel or DC guy. I'm more of a Star sure. Wars guy. Of course, I get that. Uh, Star Wars is going through a rough period right now, and so yeah, for sure. I'll just I'll just leave it at that. But to tell me just about yourself and your background, how did you first discover biblical faith? and fantastical stories yeah for sure well i I mean i was raised in a christian home and so there was definitely that's the faith component was always always there and i was actually um really interested in history and stories in that sense so read a lot of or listened to a lot of stories as a small child about historical stuff but my first introduction probably to like you know real christian fiction would have probably been um when i like turned six years old and my mom gave me for Christmas um, Little Pilgrim's Progress. So I think it's uh, Helen a. L. Taylor or whatever. Oh, nice. And it was, yeah. the, it was the kids' version of Pilgrim's Progress that kind of been written, you know, really, really allegorized for a kid. But that was really my first um, introduction to that and probably was one of the most influential fiction books that I ever got my hands on. Soon after that, I think I saw the Chronicles of Narnia movie that Disney did for the first time. And that completely, you know, got me enveloped in everything C.S. Lewis. So I started the Chronicles of Narnia series after that. And then eventually some more modern Christian authors I really fell in love with. And then C.S. Lewis, probably when I was in middle school, uh, I mean, Gerard Tolkien in middle school, and uh, just developed from there to all sorts of different stories, and um, fiction in that sense, and fantastical truth and stuff like that. You know, that's a really cool story to hear that you saw the Narnia movies first and that made you want to read the books because, you know, so many people we've talked to, it's been the opposite. And really, in fact, uh, Stephen's background is being involved in before Lorehaven and everything. He was involved with uh, Narnia Web and really? Narnia yeah, Web, yeah. I, I think got started because of the rumors of the movies coming out. I don't know the whole history, but, you know, that used to be a big thing that they would talk about and discuss and debate. You know, what about this aspect of the movie versus that aspect? And then the rumors of the next one, they had been readers of Narnia since whenever. But your journey is very similar to mine. I must have read Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe and maybe some of the other ones is a really young kid, but I don't have any memory of it. And so it wasn't until the movies came out that I'm like, oh, maybe I should read these again. And then I had kids and then they wanted to read them. So like, okay, let's read them together. Listen to the audio book. And. It's just really fun to read them as an adult. Someone told me recently that when Lewis first shared the line, which in the wardrobe with uh, like a writer friend, it, it really got uh, shot down by this friend that was like, you should stop this. <laughs> and uh, so then he shared it with another friend's uh, children and they loved it. And he's like, okay, I, I think I'm going to go ahead with this. And so it's just interesting that, you know, some adults weren't, keen on it but uh but now it's like it's loved by children and adults and so your story is another sure. testimony I, i'm reading i mean i'm rereading through the entire series right now and nice. so i'm on i'm on the silver chair right now and it's just going back and reading th- those stories it's probably been two three years since i read through the series last and just the the depth that he can actually cover with just his one-liners like you yeah. know it's like you'll you'll ponder over a one-liner for like 15 20 minutes in yeah. those books and it's just like you know there's so much there that he could have talked more about but he just like let it go you know so it's they're amazing w- which book did you say you're reading right now in the series i'm i'm on the silver chair silver so chair okay yeah okay i have not read that one yet so i'm i'm really? working my way up to that yep yeah. yeah but we uh you know we've got several different uh versions of 
the Chronicles of Narnia and the family. We got, of course, like the paperback box set. That was what our older kids started out with. And then I was like, you know, I want to read this, but in a, like a, a little bit better format. So I got the like hardback omnibus. Right. Uh, and then I, then I eventually found a color illustrated mm-hmm. uh, full series and it's like full size uh, hardback. Yes. And, that, and that's been great to read to the kids. Uh, but then I've also been getting the, um, the original uh, individual hardbacks that have the, I don't know if it's the 1970s or 80s wow. like art, artwork on it. And I'm just like finding them in like used bookstores and they're so cool. Uh, and so that's what my third daughter is starting to read through now. So plus we got the uh, focus on the family audio drama series. So that, that's going to be our, our summer road trip uh, playlist. <laughs> I had the honor one time of going to focus on the family and seeing where they did that recording. They had like, you know, the little wardrobe and everything. It was cool. What would you say is an element of the silver chair Mm -hmm. that really connects to, uh, to your own faith? Yeah, it's my own faith. I think, well, yeah, I think, um, the major part is towards the end. Um, there's this showdown between the villain and the heroes. I don't want to give it all away, but it really comes down to, um, reality and truth. And I think that that's so, so applicable to our time and um, to the era that I've been raised in with my faith is, you know, what is reality? How can you know that something's true? How can you know something isn't just made up and just a better version of something you believe? And so I think that that's one of the main areas because that's something that's present throughout the entire book. But really, it's not the big battle. There's really no, no big battle in the silver chair. It's really this thing with words and with the villain questioning truth that the big um i guess the big com- confrontation happens with i think that's probably the biggest area um that mm. it talks about that would t- like touch my faith that's great uh that that's a direct tie-in to our um two episodes ago we had daniel friend come on the show and talk about his new uh dramatic audio series called the testimony of calvin lewis and it's all about this virtual reality device that lets you see into your mind and your memories and then there's these instructions about oh you got to get rid of this part of your brain and that part of your mind and you know and it's got these characters questioning well you know who's telling me the truth and what is what is truth anyway um and that you know that is and it's like when when jesus was on trial and Pilate says to him well what is truth you know jesus says he's here to testify to that and that that is yeah believe it or not that is still a question a lot of people are asking uh today they're saying you know we're we're arguing over the definitions of things that were taken for granted for so long for sure i mean johnny cash wrote a whole song about what is truth right and the how the younger generation is going to always be asking what is truth so for sure it's something that we've always grappled with but i think it's most prevalent in our society today i think the really sad thing is there's just so many people that have bought into this idea that there's no truth but power yes and so yeah. everything gets viewed through that lens that it's all about just who has power and that's people define truth and reality. And it's like, you can't really live in a world for very long where that's, that's how reality is constructed because it just falls apart. So there either there's an objective reality or not. <laughs> yeah. The victors don't only write history. They get to now determine what truth is supposedly. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's for sure what's happening. You know, as I mentioned to you off the air, we, we are a kind of a hybrid homeschool family and we, Right. We kind of moved in and out of that a couple of times with our kids, but so the, the whole homeschool genre, I guess you could say, of living, is still kind of relatively new to to Naomi and I because we weren't we were not homeschooled as kids. And I went to my very first homeschool conference here in Round Rock um, a few months ago. Okay, but wow. um, but you uh, you know, you being involved with FPA, your family being involved. What I want to talk about is. How do homeschool families and groups view fantasy, fantastical fiction? What has been the view and and what is kind of the current view of that? I think you'll find in the in the earlier days, so I'm technically part of a second generation or third generation of homeschooling, um, if you want to look at it through through um that sense. So I think early on, the first two generations really, they viewed fantastical fiction as something that they they wanted nothing to do with, really in a lot of ways, outside of C.S. Lewis, maybe, you know. Um, Chronicles of Narnia was okay. Uh, John Bunyan with Pilgrim's Progress was okay. Lord of the Rings was was though oddly off the books. That one wasn't okay in huh. a lot of ways. Interesting. Yeah, just because I think I think a lot of it stemmed from 
the world he created and having, you know, the wizards or whatever. Although he, it's very different than say other secular things would have been. But also I think since um, homeschooling was mainly Protestant based for so long that um, his Catholicism, I think scared some people um, with, with that. So that, that's really where the mindset was. And then you had my generation of homeschooling um, come through and we were a lot of, a lot of my generation come from parents who weren't homeschooled. So we were, you know, we were the first per- person in our, in our family to be homeschooled. I was um, the first person in my homeschool to be, my family to be homeschooled through all the way and all that sort of stuff. And so there was a much kinder look to fiction. Um, C.S. Lewis at this point had gained a lot more popularity in America. My mom and my dad had read, my dad had read The Hobbit and then my mom had read Prince Caspian, which I thought that was really odd. Um, she said, mm-hmm. you know, she said all her Bible verses one summer and the prize was Prince Caspian, which I was like, it's so <laughs> out of order to give Prince Caspian first to like a kid, you know. Oh, that's and she's so like, strange I read to it. think about that. Yeah. yeah, and she's like, I read it. I had, I understood nothing. I was like, <laughs> yeah, if I read Prince Caspian, I don't think I'd understand anything either. Um, so it was a much kinder look to fiction. And and then by by my time at this point, Tommy Nelson was a big publisher. Thomas Nelson, mm, yeah. the parent company is a much bigger publisher. And so fiction at that point has gained a lot more popularity um, amongst adults and y- young people and everything. And mainly in the realm of allegory, you know, is where a lot of the fantasy you'll see. I think science fiction really still hasn't caught on in the Christian community, at least not good science fiction. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, you really started seeing some of the good um, fantasy stuff come out, you know, 98, maybe 1998. And then definitely the early to mid 2000s is really when you start seeing that rise of stuff that's actually more defendable on a literature and story level and not just the morals. Yeah. I think about science fiction a lot and sort of what, what the collisions are between science fiction and Christianity, what some of the, uh, you know, what, what some of the common ground is, but also kind of where the, the battle lines are sort of drawn. I think sometimes it's unforced errors. Sometimes it's because so much of the science fiction that's in the market is dominated by, an atheistic or a nihilistic kind of viewpoint. But uh, I think sci- I think there's so much potential for science fiction to take off within the Christian readership because so much of it is warning us. Yes. <laughs> so, so much of like uh, Ray Bradbury famously said, I, I don't write science fiction to, pr- to predict the future, but to prevent it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, and that's, that's always like my joke online is that, some crazy scientist has a hatches a plan for something and there's a news headline and I'm like, Oh, I've seen this movie before. You yeah, know, it's like, exactly. like what, one thing recently was, uh, Oh yeah, they're going to put this, uh, computer chip in a, in a monkey's brain. And now he can play pong with his mind and, uh, he's getting smarter. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've seen this movie before and it doesn't end well. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. It ends with wars and planets and all sorts of other <laughs> sorts of things, you know. Um, no, and ends that's, with the Statue um, of Liberty being buried under the <laughs> the ocean. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think Charlton Heston's in that one, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was like um, we did a uh, episode on the podcast that we did on on Fahrenheit four fifty one and Ray ba- Bradbury oh, and everything, great. and we talked about how often, especially that area era with Orwell and Bradbury and. Huxley, all of them, they were really prophetic in a lot of their ways. Yeah. I think science fiction and maybe the dystopian genre in, sp- in particular was so prophetic of what where our culture would be. And I think that in th- I think that's what great Christian science fiction could be. But I don't think that we've necessarily lived up to that, except maybe with C.S. Lewis's space trilogy and some of his short stories. Um yeah. C.S. Lewis really gets underwritten with the short stories that he wrote. You know, not a lot of people appreciate those. But those were some of, I think, some of his greatest stuff. That's some of the stuff I enjoy the most of his. Um, but I, I have hope for sure. I think that I think that it's possible. Well, and it's also interesting. Uh, I'm reading a book about C.S. Lewis and, and sort of his, uh, well, I'm reading a couple of his books, but also books about him and sort right. of his difference in worldview with his contemporary uh, science fiction writers. So like Arthur C. Clarke. And he, he, was not a, he was not a fan of Clarke, and, but more so of, uh, he was not a fan of the different ideas that Clark was trying to weave in 
to science fiction. And so, look, I just look at it like it's it's a battleground of ideas for sure. It's a it's a battleground in our culture. I but you know, with with fantasy, it can be that. Uh, I I think there's a lot of times there's an it's a more natural fit for a lot of Christians because it's like Oh, you know, fan, we think of medieval, we, we think of, um, you know, Knights of the Round ta- Table, we think of chivalry, we think back to kind of simpler times, but also, you know, fantasy has magic or dragons or you right. know, evil sorcerers or whatever. So how have those kind of fantastical elements, uh, specifically like, you know, w- within fantasy, how have those kind of been viewed, you know, in the homeschool realm? And then how has that changed? Well, I think, I think you're right there because, um, it is it harkens back to a simpler time and to a real time where sci-fi doesn't necessarily. So you actually can play homeschoolers feel they can play it safe because you can either have the stories that do have the magic, do have the dragons and everything, or you can go with a purely medieval world. That's fake, but Mm -hmm. that looks very much like our own real world. And so not necessarily a lot of magic, maybe. And not the dragons, but there's a lot of battles, a lot of things that look maybe like the War of the Roses in history or looks like um, things that happened. And I think that's one of the reasons why fantasy what is and was the predominant thing for, for Christians. It's also a lot easier to make an allegory out of fantasy and out of that medieval genre. First, because we saw Paul Bunyan do it or, or John Bunyan, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, and he is really in a lot of ways the the fall you know the 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 one that everyone holds up and then c.s lewis did it in a lot of ways although i wouldn't say that the majority of the chronicles of narnia is allegory it's really just the few that you know the the little things we see in the line the witch in the wardrobe maybe even the magician's nephew and then maybe some stuff in the last battle but the majority of it is not by any means um allegory and so i think it's i think that's why homeschoolers and christians in a broader sense have liked fantasy because they can either play it safe with no magic and the appeal to the more conservative side of the homeschool movement, or they can do it, but they can do it as, you know, miracles and stuff, you know, Aslan coming back with a deeper magic. And so I think that's one of the reasons fantasy has been so appealing is because it can appeal to a wider audience that comes from different backgrounds tremendously. Now, Stephen uh, found this quote from fantasy author Wayne Thomas Batson, who wrote uh, wrote out a, a long post about a couple different topics. But in this one section, uh, he said this, quote, On a book tour with several Christian fantasy authors in the early 2000s, we attended a huge homeschool gathering that might have led to another, even more massive opportunity with a substantially larger homeschooling group. The authors had all FedExed copies of our flagship books to the president of the group. Unfortunately, this woman, a Christian leader, told us not to bother coming, but that she was, in fact, grateful to have screened our books, particularly my book, The Door Within. She called it a tool of the devil and promised to warn every other Christian homeschool association to avoid us and our evil books. Wow. Now, occasionally I might accurately be described as a tool, but a tool of the devil. Sheesh. I sure hope not. End quote. <laughs> I know Wayne and um, I've actually pre-read some of his books and I've, I've actually gotten to know him over the years. Yeah. I've never read that one. Yeah. That's crazy. Especially door within trilogy. That's um, yeah. I'd say the, the most, the most allegory, most um, <laughs> Christian Christianese book that he could have written. Um, out of his stuff, and I think it's some of his best stuff. Um, that's the first. That was my first um introduction to Wayne Thomas Batson. So yeah, no, that's crazy. What was funny is when I first heard about this book, I went and looked up, you know, Amazon reviews or whatever, and I saw so many reviews that were like, "Gosh, I went to this book to find a fantasy, and I came back with a you know a sermon or a Bible exactly. study, and like I didn't want all this Christian garbage." And it's like. What? Like, okay, yeah. if if that's how readers, you know, how did this other interpretation happen with this uh, homeschool conference leader? It's just, but again, you know, this is 20 years ago, so the, yeah. the tastes were very different. Makes, the yeah, very the different attitude, tastes. yeah, the attitude towards fantasy was very different. Yeah, uh, you know, sure. this is before uh, Lord of the Rings and uh, the Chronicles of Narnia hit the big screens. Exactly. And yeah. so, so even the Christian, you know, even the flagship Christian novels of, of years past were not really on people's radars. No, yeah, not at all. 
and and that's like you know one of the one of the first probably in my middle school years books that I was really introduced to into the more the older genre of Christian um, fantasy would have been The Door Within. And I thought that the way that he wrote that was phenomenal. You know, the two worlds paralleled and everything. It was different than anything I'd ever read before because it was still set in our world, but set in another world. And I thought it was great. I not, you know, hearing, hearing that, I'm just like, that's crazy, you know, because I thought <laughs> so phenomenal, you know, even times I, I mean, I'm a Christian and I felt, you know, preached to a little bit, but like, I thought it was great story, great, great motifs, everything. I thought it was good. Yeah, yeah especially it, that it age. Must, it, it must be the you know the Harry Potter effect, yep. or the uh, the early stages of that, where it's like that was kind of what everyone associated with yep. fantasy was, was Harry Potter. Was you know, li- like it or love it, that's kind of what came to everyone's mind. Yeah, and of course, Christian attitudes or that have changed a lot, which we don't need to go into. But Stephen uh, found this other great quote. This is from Josiah DeGraff. He's been with Story Embers, and he's also a staff creator with Lorehaven. And, and so this is what he says, quote, So anecdotally, I definitely know that growing up, Harry Potter was a really controversial topic and a story many Christians I know were opposed to. I also know that these days, I don't know a ton of people who are still opposed to it. Most have mellowed out. And while there are still some, it doesn't have the controversy it used to have when we talk about it in places like the young writer on Story Embers. I also just see an explosion in Christian young people who love fantasy over at the young writer where we currently have about 800 young writers in our program. I suspect a good 50% of them or so write fantasy and most of them are homeschooled. So there are growing numbers here End quote. That was, that was one of the things Stephen and I talked about was, um, I have some friends and this was a discussion that they were they were having was about Harry Potter because I mean I was raised in a homeschool and in, in, in a church community so there were very mixed views on on that on that subject in particular and so you know I had tons of friends who weren't allowed to read it and as a kid I wasn't and then I had plenty of friends who were allowed to read it and I think that um, there were some really interesting points that some of them made and that was you know they read the books um, as they were coming out. And so it was, you know, like, I think it was a new book every year, every two years or so. And they're like, you know, you grew up with the books. And by the last book, there's like some more, ma- some more mature themes. It's not even necessarily the magic or any of that. Like some of the themes in it are just more mature, you know, with some of the, some of the stuff that's going on in it. And they're like, you know, growing up with it, it was completely okay. Cause I was maturing with the books. Some of them even had concerns, you know, about, the people who are right behind me, you know, people right behind our own generation. They're like, I'm not necessarily sure if I'd want my little sibling, you know, at seven, when I started reading the first book to read all of the series all at once right now. And so I think that was some, and then um, I heard, I think it was um, maybe Brian Davis who put it, you know, one of the reasons that he is okay with it, but also warns people about the books is just the only problem that he really has with Rowling is that she rewards her characters for bad behavior. Mm. When you look at, you know, his books or you look at C.S. Lewis, I mean, well, I'll, I keep going back to him. His characters, when they do something bad, there is a punishment for it or there is a consequence for it. And Rowling doesn't really do that. She actually rewards her characters for bad behavior, whether it be cheating, lying, whatever it is. And so I think that there are, there's bigger concerns per se. Now, I think when people are looking at the stories than magic, like I was like, I was like, that really isn't a concern anymore. It may be, what is the story teaching my, my children about, you know, being a good person or whatever. But then Steve and I were saying, if you want a great idea about a discussion on suffering, Harry literally drinks the cup of wrath, like just as Jesus would, you know, he's this in the story, he's supposed to be a Christ-like figure. So if you want something that actually understands some like classical medieval motifs about suffering, he literally drinks the cup of wrath. How can you get any more Christian than that? But also how can you get any more humanistic atheistic than the story as well so i think i think it's an interesting debate that goes on around it and i enjoy watching and listening to it for sure yeah and i I think what that represents to me is that the discernment process over fantasy has really matured in the last few decades i think so that instead of just a simplistic this has magic in it therefore it's bad it's like well what are the moral lessons that are being taught you know, by this book and, and and what are, what is the kind of moral character arc that's happening within the story? Because you can turn on just popular TV shows right now 
they they can have the exact same troublesome lessons for kids. And th- this is something I I love about my wife is that she can watch uh you know a Disney movie or something with our kids, and say, now did you catch how the, the kids uh, left the parents and didn't tell them where they were going? And did you catch how the parents, uh, you know, later in the story were apologizing to the kids for being, you know, foolish. And really the story is about how the kids knew everything and the parents knew nothing. She's like, can, can you see what that would do to a family? Right. You know, to instill this idea that, you know, you need to be independent. Your parents don't know anything. You have to teach your parents everything. And it's like, and that can be in a contemporary story, like not a fantastical story, but just like, Exactly. You know, a, a high school movie or and something. It doesn't even it doesn't even have to be any language, nothing right. like no innuendos, like no nothing, but it's still equally subver- subversive yeah. to the family and to Christian values for sure. Yeah. So that's why, you know, on this podcast we like to talk about the meaning of stories. Yeah. And not just like the window dressing and not just the genre, but like what what is this story about? Exactly. <laughs> you know, what what are the truths in it? What are the idols in it? Uh, how does it lead you towards or away from God and, and the the things that you accept? But, you know, there are a number of, of fantasy books. I, I wouldn't want my kids to read like things that I read when I was younger. Um, same with some science fiction or or at least just wait till they're an adult to read it. There is a side to fantasy that can, you know, really make the occult seem uh, tempting um, or that can seem or that, that can make certain lifestyles seem very attractive. I think it's all about discerning the right story for the right age, uh, rather than sort of a one size fits all. What hopes and trends do you expect to see among homeschool fantasy fans in the near future? Yeah, I, I really hope to see, I hope to see and this is really just a matter of time. This I don't think is really a matter of like, you know, will we get there? I think it's, it, it will take a lot of time. But um, one of the reasons J.R. Tolkien was so easily able to build his world was because England had a big history. And he really pulled from a lot of it. He pulled from also ancient Norris and Greek mythology. But America, in comparison to the rest of the world, in comparison to England, when even he wrote about it, he, it's, it's fairly young. We really don't yeah, have our own we're, myths. We're we really babies. Have, exactly. <laughs> and so we don't have our own myths. We don't have our own history um, developed to the same point necessarily that they were. So it's not that I don't think that we'll ever see another J.R. Tolkien or an American version of a J.R. Tolkien. It's we have to let those stories come come to life, right? We have to let those great stories, those great myths come to life. Um, and I, so that's really one of my hopes. And I really think that will probably arise out of the homeschool community. Um, I think that will um, arise out of a Christian community, just as it did with Tolkien. And I think that there's a lot of interesting um, ideas and a lot of things about human nature that will be debated in that, just as it was in his own time. He was not only contemplating human nature throughout history, he was grappling with some issues of his own day. And so that's, I think, one of my um, my big hopes. And then I also, uh, I have hope that, you know, we'll see even greater fantasy and science fiction come through. I think that will mainly be through the short story. I think the short story has gained more popularity in recent years. Hmm. And I think it's a good thing. Um, it's it's shorter. It's more condensed. You can focus on more details. And I think that that's really where a lot of maybe the great novelists and the great, you know, great storytellers of our age will, will first really be birthed. It is not necessarily to self publishing or getting a published contract with some big publisher, but getting um a short story published in a blog or on a fiction website because that's our that's our equivalent to a newspaper maybe as it was back in the forties or fifties. You know, I often think about our own culture and like you said, the the history is very short. And one of the major elements of our history though is the frontier. You know, the yeah. fact that the the pilgrims came over on the Mayflower and the fact that Columbus right. sailed here uh, the fact that the, the expansion out west, you know, the Oregon Trail and the original Oregon Trail, not just the game. Right, um, right, right. You know, just the, the settling of all these different areas around the continent, along with, you know, the fact that we, we had the space race and we're, we're traveling into this frontier and we're, we're going to the moon. And now Elon Musk wants to take us to Mars. And so we, we've always sort of had this frontier mindset of like the, the new, the next, the unexplored. For me, that's what gives me a lot of hope that that science fiction could take off even more within Christian circles, uh, particularly with, and I, I think there's a very strong connection with homeschooling because for 
you know, as we, we were talking um, off air earlier, there are 5 million homeschool kids now. Yeah. And when I was growing up, there was like 100,000 or 200,000 or something. So it, sure. it's exploded uh, in recent years for a lot of factors. And so this is a frontier for a lot of parents. And I have a friend that just moved in the middle of nowhere. And so, yeah, actually two different friends that have done this. And so in their homeschooling, and so it's like a double frontier, right? It's like a, right. like a frontier lifestyle and a frontier like <laughs> education <Yep>. style. <laughs> and so I, I think that this aspect of our culture lends itself very easily uh, to science fiction. And so that, that's kind of what I personally hope will, will start to catch yeah. on even more. And, and I think that's definitely right with the whole idea of AI and everything. I think people yeah. are going to want real risk, um, not just, you know, artificial risk. And so I think that is one of the reasons why, you know, maybe we will be going to stay, space is because we've really, in a lot of ways, done all we could in a lot of ways here. I mean, we've, we still have to conquer the seas, really. We haven't done that. I don't think we'll be doing that for a while. But um, it is part of the American, I think, even Western and just human desire to go out and explore and go into the unknown. I think it's part of it's part of God's command, right? The man should take his wife and leave his father's house. And so that's that's I mean, right there in Genesis, too. And so I think that's one of the reasons why the idea of the frontier is so appealing to us and why science fiction has been so big in America, I think, um, more so than I think really any other country, maybe Australia, just because of all the jedi down there with star wars but besides <laughs> that you know um i think that america is pretty much really the the cornered the market on science fiction well ethan it's been great talking to you today and uh m- maybe one day we'll talk in person on mars or a moon base or something like that and uh, oh, i look forward to it yeah so we'll, we'll have the fba conference in uh you know apollo square or something on on the uh yeah, the moon. exactly yeah <laughs> thanks for joining us Thank, yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate um, being able to come on here and talk to you about these, these great stories and these ideas that don't often get discussed. All right. God bless. Zach, I really appreciated your conversation with uh, Ethan, and thanks again for taking over how once my technical equipment became cursed. I especially appreciated the comparison between fantasy and sci-fi, and Ethan's thought that fantasy is a more natural fit for homeschoolers, but Sci-fi just takes a little bit longer to get used to. And by the way, if you think sci-fi takes longer, you should see how people react to horror and paranormal. Uh, That's even uh, (laughs) further behind in terms of the genre popularity contest among homeschooling families. I must admit that uh, if I absolutely had to choose personally, if someone put a gun to my head and said, hey, which is it, fantasy or sci-fi? If I had to choose between these two favorite children, I would, at least for now, choose science fiction if for no other reason than i tend to support the underdogs but another reason is simply this fantasy has its strengths but science fiction whether or not it's soft sci-fi or harder sci-fi that gets more into the technological predictions and speculations i think each one of those types of sci-fi is something that we need as we move forward into an increasingly technologically crazed world We need stories that are going to speculate about these technologies, have some fun doing that, have some fun celebrating how humans make stuff using God's stuff, but that also serve as warnings about the cultural problems that can result from these technologies and from these changes in government. We need science fiction, not just uh, fantasy, basically sci-fi like Star Wars, which is basically just fantasy with spaceships, but we need sci-fi like more like the Star Trek kind that is set in our universe. Uh, sci-fi that takes place closer to home in order to warn us about those things that can happen and also help speculate about ways forward, ways that Christians specifically can engage with these kinds of cultural trends and scientific pursuits. Uh, I would love to see more stories about that. Anytime I see one at Lorehaven, I am all over it. Uh, Carrie Neitz's book, Lost Bits, uh, counts as one of those, I believe. And there are barely any human characters in that, spoiler alert. This is not a story about Christians versus the world. It's a robo-drama that in some ways is about uh, some of the questions that we're facing now. Uh, Zach, I was actually also recently re-watching some clips from Doctor Who uh, going back to 2005. Now, this is not a Christian show as much as they like to play with the imagery sometimes. And in fact, uh, the show was revived by a gay atheist showrunner. And yet at the same time, I was noting that in uh, the second episode of the series one in 2005, uh, the villain is a woman named Lady Cassandra, who is aboard a space station along with a bunch of other rich people watching the end of planet Earth. 
the funding ran out for preserv- uh, preserving the planet and the sun has uh, finally overcome uh, the old world. Nobody lives there anymore. It's uh, basically just a preserve, but now it's all up. Anyway, Lady Cassandra turns out to be the villain. And at one point she is talking with our heroine about how she's, well, she's, she claims to be the last human. And by the way, Lady Cassandra is not a human. Uh, she is a giant piece of skin stretched out in a steel frame with her brain attached oh, wow. by a tank beneath. She has had Yikes. more than 700 surgeries in order to maintain this perfect form. And she claims that mm. she's the last human and everybody else is just kind of a mongrel. Uh, she's talking with her heroine about how long ago on planet Earth uh, she was originally born a boy. Lady Cassandra in 2005 is the villain of the show. And I'm just kind of watching wow. now, you know, 17 some odd years later. Canceled. Shocked. Yeah. <laughs> shocked by this. Like, uh, well, on the one hand, like, oh, wow, this is an early agenda moment. But on the other hand, she's the villain. And I don't know if yeah. I learn anything from that, but it, it and, and the story, frankly, kind of plays it safe. Uh, you can talk about, oh, well, this is a, this is a creature of the future. You know, in the future, we'll just be able to swap genders with surgery. It's uh it's magical. It's mad science. That is wonderful. But on the other hand, she is the villain and it's not incidental to the story that she is literally a, um, a, a trampoline, shall we say a, a character uses some other words to describe her attitude, but she's basically a skin trampoline by this point, mm-hmm. uh, mutilated by all her surgeries. And apart from any political stuff here, it's just an implicit warning by accident from science fiction that only science fiction can do. So that could be a whole episode, yeah. Zach. I don't want to belabor that point, but I would love to see more Christian made science fiction specifically uh, in order to help disciple us, not just to entertain us, but to help prepare us for the real world that Jesus calls us to serve. You know, in Rod Dreher's book, Live Not by Lies, he talks a lot about the myth of progress and just this um, religious belief that in the future, everything will be better and mankind will be more advanced. and it's sort of, uh, you know, people talk about the God of the gaps and it, this is like the future of the gaps or like the future technology savior of the gaps. And, you know, you mentioned Star Trek and I thought Star Trek did that so well when they introduced the Borg, you know, but before that was introduced, it's kind of like, oh, in the future we'll have utopia. And it's like, well, maybe not. <laughs> maybe some people will have taken technology too far. And yet here's what I love about that aspect of Star Trek, Stephen is that they don't defeat the Borg by just throwing away all their technology, which there is another science fiction series where that's basically their solution that I'm not going to talk about because that really disappointed me. But in Star Trek, they defeat the Borg with technology. and But more than that, they defeat it by preserving their own humanity. And, you know, in the very literal sense, they, you know, they don't put Borg implants on themselves to fight the Borg. And they really have to band together as humans and work together and that was kind of the interesting dynamic there. It's like the Borg are this collective and there's really no individuals, but the Federation, it's a bunch of individuals from a bunch of different planets and they have to work together somehow. But yes, they use technology to defeat a technological villain. And so technology itself is not evil, but it's, it's technology combined with that myth of progress that, that we can just use these tools to perfect ourselves and save ourselves. And that's, that's the real danger. You know, technology is a tool. It's, it's a great tool. It's a horrible God. Amen. And that's why we're using technology now as a tool to reach you with warnings about technology and encouragement of discernment and celebration of homeschool families who love fantastical fiction. Perhaps you have some feedback about that. If so, use technology to communicate that to us. Email podcast at lorehaven.com with your thoughts or tag us at lorehaven on the socials. If you're on the website, lorehaven.com, looking at the podcast there, Write a comment on the, uh, on the page there or use the uh, feedback box to send that to us. From there, let's go over to our comm station, a redemptive use of technology. Uh, I actually meant to circle back to this earlier, Zach. Uh, last month, we found this uh, great review from a podcast listener uh, using the Apple podcast platform. Uh, her name is Katie.Briggs, and her review was titled, quote, Encouraging and Relevant. She goes on to say, Thank you for keeping us up to date on the industry, bringing us back to what matters and interviewing awesome guests in quote. Awesome. Indeed, Katie. Thank you so much for that encouragement. Uh, we don't you know, solicit reviews or five stars or all of that uh, often, but we certainly are indebted. If you want to go to your podcast platform and rank us there, 
Thank you so much, Katie, for that review. And to you, our listener, it definitely helps us if you leave a review that helps other people find this podcast. Of course, you can always just share it with a friend. That that very much helps. We would love to spread this vision of Christian fantastical stories to other listeners. Next on Fantastical Truth, we have talked before about the need for churches to promote these kinds of stories as discipleship tools for God's people. But what about the home? What kinds of space are you making at your house for books, whether it is in your schedule for reading or literally on bookshelves in a particular room alongside other rooms? Like, How exactly do you put together a library for the kinds of books you enjoy? Zach has been enjoying putting together this library. I've seen it in person because we are blessed to live close. I have a Lorehaven headquarters with similar situation. So we want to hear from you. What kinds of ways do you feature your books? How do you store them? How do you put together a library of books that are going to help you on your mission, helping serve God's world for Christ's glory? That's our next exploration on Fantastical Truth. Meanwhile, whether you're homeschooled, whether you're public schooled, whether you're private schooled, whether you're unschooled, maybe need to go back to school, whatever kind of schooling, make sure that you are making a place for fantastical fiction, not just for education, but for recreation. God has given us these stories to help us work in his world. They therefore require discernment, but he's also given us these stories to enjoy, not just as individuals, but as families, as we continue to seek and find his fantastical truth. 